So I get asked all the time, Chris, what is the average rate of return or what, the, what do the returns look like inside of an infinite banking policy, inside of a properly designed whole life insurance contract? What does that look like? What are the returns from short-term perspective, from a long-term perspective? And there's a lot of information out there. I think this is kind of one of the most misleading kind of components of uh, infinite banking and how it works. People talk about arbitrage and they talk about how the returns work in your life and in the policy and whatnot. And all that is kind of uh, a bunch of noise, quite frankly. Um, it, it, it's made more, uh, I guess, glorious and sexy than it really is. And so in this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down exactly uh, what the returns are and what that means for you inside of an infinite banking policy or properly designed whole life insurance contract, as I like to call it. So that's it. I can't wait to see you in that. Hey, what's going on, cash flow hackers? It's Chris with Life 180. And for this video, we're going to be talking about what are the returns inside of an infinite banking policy. Now, behind me, I got my board. Um, what we're going to be talking about is I've got three designs. Now, I did a video on this a couple weeks ago or last week um, talking about the 1090 design, the 4060 design, and what does a front load get into? Now, I'm not gonna go through the nuances of how they all work differently and what one's better than the other and so on and so forth for you because I've got that other video that will do that. I've just got these illustrations up there because I think it will serve as a good foundational uh, place to reference uh, for the context of this video. If I need to bounce to something and reference uh, some information on an illustration, I think it'll be beneficial. Now, that said, Let's get into the nuts and bolts of uh, what are the returns inside of an infinite banking policy because here's the bottom line. A lot of people will say that the returns inside of whole life insurance are horrible. Well, before I get into anything else, I think it's important to say this is really what it's all about. It's about control. It's about creating opportunity and being an opportunistic investor. That's why I focus on this a lot. But control allows you to have more opportunity. You ever notice? If you have more money, the more access to capital you have, opportunity just kind of seems to track you down. It kind of seems to find you. Well, that's why, because when you have control of your money, you can, it can track you down, you can take advantage of the opportunity. And really what it is, is a savings account on steroids. And so what happens is we're able to leverage our life insurance contract. It's a way to get our dollars to perform more than one function in our life. And obviously the rate of return matters, but if you're looking at what you're getting from a rate of return perspective inside of the policy, you're looking at it from a completely backwards perspective. And now I don't, I don't want to like evade the question because it's an absolutely pertinent question. Uh, what, what are the returns that you get, but you can't calculate them in a traditional way, the way that we've kind of linearly been taught to think about what are the returns on our investments. At the end of the day, there's a lot of variables that come into the equation. When it, when it comes to overall returns. And this is why I always say I love utilizing a properly designed whole life insurance contract as the foundation of our life because of the fact that it's the only financial strategy that I know when you implement it, it forces you to become who you need to be to get to where you want to go, right? Like that, that just is what it is. And so, you know, from that perspective, when I, when I look at control, when I look at like, what do we want to accomplish? You know, I, I think about, okay, what are the rates of returns that we're after? Okay, so let's just look at a policy. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna actually go to the board here and I'm gonna kind of go through here and I'm gonna take a look and, and see like, all right, inside of this, what do the returns look like? Let's take a look. Uh, let's just take a look at the, the front loaded policy. So you can see here, $10,000 annual premium every year uh, with $100,000 front loaded into the policy. I'll zoom that in a little bit for you. So you could see year one, the, the ROR I'll put over here is negative, right? It's negative, um, probably eight point whatever percent, right? So it's negative. Uh, year two, you know, you're still, you put 120 in, you only got 112, so it's still negative. Year three, still negative, right? Um, it's not until year four or year five, check it, year five here, where you put in 149 and you're basically at zero. I mean, you're still a little bit negative, but I mean, for all, it's a rounding error at that point in time, uh, you're, you're effectively zero. So starting in year six, it starts to go in the positive. And you could just, you, you, can, you can just pop into a calculator, what are, the, what are the internal rates of return? And that's fine. 
Um, and you could do that and you could say, hey, over a 10 year period, I put in 220, I got uh, 27 or $27,941 extra cash. But what does that mean? Like, what are the extra rates of return? Like, cause what, what, are, what are we thinking about? Like when we look at the rate of return, this isn't about just this dollars in and dollars available. What, what we have to do is we have to think about like, there are things that are happening in our life that we need to deal with anyway. That's why I call this a savings account on steroids because it's fair to assume that you probably need or at least hopefully want life insurance. If you, if you have a family, if you have business partners, you, need, you have that need for life insurance. And so when we look at that, we go, okay, what are we able to avoid? If, if we got this $1.9 million in death benefit right here, uh, you know, let's say, what would the term expense be that we saved, right? So it's term expense saved. Let's say you were gonna spend $1,000 a year on term. Right, so that's that's an extra, you know, ten thousand dollars over that period of time, right? That doesn't get calculated into the rate of return. But what are we doing here? We're talking about because of the fact that you're able to get your dollars to perform more than one function. We're talking about you being more financially efficient. Now, obviously, because of the fact that you were able to have the term insurance negated or at least minimized, let's just talk apples to apples, let's say you could get rid of it, that's a $10,000, $1,000 per year more efficiency, and when you look at that, if you were to add that in there, that would add, if you were to calculate that into the rate of return, that would increase that rate of return. Now, does it really do it in the policy? No, but it's just, it's more efficient because that's more money that you have in your pocket to operate in another area. Now, here's the other thing. You have access to this capital, right? This capital that you have right here you have access to the, the majority of that money during the time that you're utilizing it, right? And so what, what, what does that mean? What does that look like for you? Well, you can utilize that money uh, for, for uh, utilizing it to, to buy a car. Uh, you can utilize it for ultimately whatever you want, it, for major capital expenditures, for equipment, for your business, for real estate investing, what have you. Now, um, I'm a big believer that you know, you're know you never gonna get rich buying depreciating assets. However, at the same time, we all need to drive a car, right? So if I could show you a way that it would make you more efficient in the way you bought your cars, and it could just have you save money, and I've done videos explaining how much extra money that's gonna put in your car, um, you know, or how much more money you're gonna have flow through your life, because of the efficiency here, because of the way that you're recapturing this expense that you would typically pay uh, to pay a bank, it's important to, to be able to break that down. Once again, we go, we go back to these three things here, the opportunity, right? The opportunity, control, and opportunity, those two things right there. Because at the end of the day, when you have this kind of money locked in an account that you have access to, and it's protected against lawsuits, it's, it's got all the other benefits to it, and it's performing more than one function, now you can access it for car, for real estate, for your business, whatever you need, right? And, and by accessing that money, or by having access, it gives you control. So, you know, with, uh, with real estate, you could go to the bank or policy, right? So let's, let's talk about it this way. 12 months ago, right, right now I'm filming this video in November of 2022. In November of 2021, we could have gone, I could have, I could have taken this exact policy. The numbers would have looked virtually the same because nothing really drastic has changed. Uh, Section 7702 got released, so I guess there were some updates a year ago, but for all intents and purposes, let's say it was the same policy a year ago. Well, I could take this 101,000 a year ago, I could have gone out and gotten a cash value line of credit with a third party bank and that interest rate would have been say 2% on that money. Now that interest rate is upwards of 7%, 6%, right? So that's it, the, the value is different, right? So the, the, the market has changed pretty su substantially. And once again, if we are just beholden to the bank to be able to get lines of credit utilizing whatever other um, assets that we have, it, you know, then we're, we're stuck playing that game. Now, the whole concept, the thing that I love about infinite banking and, and 
is, is this control and how control creates more opportunity. The thing that I'm not a believer in of infinite banking that I, I think a lot of infinite banking purists get wrong is they like to say, well, why if you're utilizing an infinite banking policy to eliminate the bank from your life, why in the world would you go out and, and leverage the bank? Well, because it's control, because money always has a cost to it. The thing that you need to understand when you take uh, a loan against your policy is the fact that when you borrow against the policy, it's not impacting this number, right? Like, so I'm gonna erase all my little scribbles here. It's when you, when you do this, it's not this, this column here, whether if I take a loan from it, this column is not gonna change regardless as long as I'm using a, a non-direct recognition company. If I use a direct recognition company, it is gonna have an impact on this and that's one of the reasons we love non-direct recognition companies because when you borrow against a policy, it does, the company does not directly recognize that loan and it does not have a negative impact on how they're uh, crediting you uh, from a dividend perspective, right? So that, that's important to understand the, the value of non-direct recognition. Now, that said, when you pay back, you are not paying yourself back. This is the, the biggest thing that, that I think infinite banking people kind of say improperly. You're never paying yourself back. You're not paying yourself. You are paying the insurance company. The difference is because you're borrowing from the insurance company, you're paying an interest rate to the insurance company, this, but this policy, once again, is gonna grow the same way no matter what. Here's the deal. We always wanna look at this and we wanna say, what's the cheapest cost of money and how do I control this? So a year ago, when I went out there and I said, hey, I wanted to get a cash value line of credit, let's say for $100,000, I could go to a third party bank, they would offer me 2% while my loan here with the insurance company was 5%, right? Is what it is. So if I know that I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be able to guarantee this and not interrupt the growth of this, whether I use the bank's line of credit and assign this to guarantee that line of credit, or if I'm leveraging the 5% policy loan provision inside of the loan and paying that 5% to the insurance company, this money is gonna grow regardless at the same rate. So what do I need to do? I need to find the cheapest cost of money always. Now, I get it. I get the principle of wanting to eliminate, wow, I don't know what I just did there, but um, I get the concept of wanting to eliminate the bank. Um, I just screwed that up. I get the concept of wanting to eliminate the bank from, uh, from your life in a way. Um, but the bottom line is like, I just, I wanna, I wanna operate the most efficient way possible, right? Like that's, that's what it comes down to. I wanna operate as efficiently as possible. And that's what a policy can do for you. It gives you flexibility and leverage and options so you can go out and operate more efficiently. You can operate more efficiently with the assets that you buy. It can be a great uh, accelerator of your wealth creation because, you know, hey, eventually, like, take a look at this. If I could go down here, you know, and, and listen, um, if I can go down here to year, you know, 15, and I have access to this capital, oh, I gotta change the color, and I have uh, access to this capital, and I can borrow against, say, 150,000 to get a rental property, and I know that by then I'm, I'm creating more arbitrage, depending on the interest rate environment and all the variables that come into play, if, if it's gonna grow by more than I'm paying, well, then now I have arbitrage right? I have that positive arbitrage and that's fantastic. I could do that in year 15. But the problem is a lot of agents are selling that you're getting positive arbitrage year one. Well, you're not. You're not getting positive arbitrage year one because you can look at this and, and when, you, when you do look at this year one, uh, year two, I'm putting in 10,000. It's only growing by 10,953. But if I'm borrowing 100, like it, it, there's, there's a greater expense um, on the money, it's not growing as efficiently because there are expenses inside of the policy. It's gonna be probably your seven, eight, nine, ten, somewhere in that range that it starts operating more efficiently where you can actually start working in some positive arbitrage conversation. If you, if you think about it from a long-term perspective, this makes all the sense in the world. However, you can't look at it from a short-term perspective uh, thinking that you're gonna have all these positive arbitrage things. However, over the lifetime, if you said, hey, I'm gonna buy a car every five years, right? If you knew that every five years you were gonna go buy a car, you know, then we could start talking about, okay, it's gonna be, can you do it? Yeah, I could go out year, year five um, and I would have, I could go buy a $50,000 car, I could borrow against this 150 almost right there. And then, you know, I would pay the loan back to the insurance company. I'm not paying myself back. When I buy a car, 
utilizing a policy loan, I'm not paying myself back. Now, are there ways that you could structure and lend money to a business that buys a car and all that stuff? Absolutely, there are. That second level, principally speaking, most people are not doing that, right? Like so, um, and not only that, if, if, if I pay my interest back, if, I, like, if I'm paying 5% to the insurance company and then I give a loan to my business as a personal loan and then I give that loan to the business and that loan, I charge the business 10%, well then my net cost of that loan is 5%. So if I charge the business 10%, well the business is gonna be able to write off the 10%. That's absolutely uh, possible. I would say talk to your accountant to see if that works for you, first of all, because um, you know you don't wanna get in trouble with, with any kind of audits or anything of that nature. So make sure that that actually works and you're able to do that and you're able to kind of play the bank from a taxation perspective. There are a lot of situations you can, but you gotta make sure you talk to your tax professional about that. Now, here's the deal though. If I, my cost, if I charged me personally, this is my policy, if I charged my bank or if I charge my business 10% and I have a cost of 5%, that means I have 5% profit, right? The business gets to write off all 10%. Me personally, I'm making 5% net profit on that loan expense from a, from a, 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 a spread, that's the positive arbitrage. I'm now gonna have to pay taxes on that. So the, there was a write off of 10% from the business, but I'm gonna have to pay taxes. So just don't realize there are no free lunches when it comes to any of this. However, it is a more efficient way to operate, right? Because now instead of uh, going through and paying the bank all that money, I'm just gonna erase this so I have room to work here. Now instead of paying the bank all that money, all that money uh, and, and, and just operating from, from a traditional mindset, that 50,000 that I used where I would borrow against, uh, where I would just borrow from the insur or borrow uh, from a bank and just pay it back and then be at zero eventually, uh, that's gonna keep growing. And by the time I pay back the loan, that 50,000 will have compounded, not been interrupted and grow to, well, you can see here 40, it's gonna, I'm contributing an extra 50,000 here, um, but the policy grows by uh, 77,000, almost 78,000 between there. So, you know, it's growing by a, a good amount of money. I'm making more money on that. That's the power of of not interrupting compounding, but it's the old adage like, when's the best time to plant a tree? 30 years ago, when's the next best time? Now, right? So when you look at this, a lot of people go, ah, this doesn't make sense. It's not as efficient right now. You're right, it's not. But I promise you, this is the thing that most people miss when they go, well, how long do I have to fund my premium? I'm gonna tell you, you only have to fund it for seven years, that's the rule. But once you hit your seven, you're not gonna wanna do anything else with your money. Show me at your seven, in this example where I'm putting $10,000 in, it's completely liquid and my policy is growing by more, almost 50% more than I'm contributing to it, right? Like if you think about it from a savings account perspective, this absolutely annihilates it starting in year two. You basically have year one where you're negative from a cash flow perspective, but starting in year two, you're putting in 10,000, it's growing by $10,953. Now, if I told you for $8,200, you could buy $1.7 million net because you minus the 1.9 minus the 227. If I, 1.7 million of net death benefit over, uh, over a 10 year period, um, actually it would be over a, a 15 year period because that's how long the term rider lasts effectively. If you could, if you could get that death benefit for 8,000 bucks for 15 years, you just got to front pay it. And then the rest of that money starting in year two is gonna operate on a cash flow positive basis, that's efficiency, right? The amount of money that it's gonna save you there is gonna be, be efficient. The way you buy your cars, it's gonna put literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in major capital expenses. I'm gonna put MCE for major capital expenses. It's gonna put more money in your pocket. The, the way that you um, buy your cash flow real estate, it's gonna put more money in your pocket. And so this is all efficiency. It's about not interrupting compounding. And when you do that, what you realize, it's not a matter, this is what we've all been duped into believing is that we need to go to school, get a job, put money in our 401k, and, and that's what happens. When you put your money in a 401k, you give up control, right? 
You give control up. That's that's the classic way. And so that's what the government wants. And now, right now, with the taxation risk and all the uh, inefficiencies that come along with that, it's pretty scary, right? So what what we're talking about is when you when you so when you put it in a whole life policy, you have control, right? And that control it, it helps us because what what we're taught is when we go to school, we get a job, we, we put it in a four hundred one k. We're taught to take ten percent of our income and uh you know and save it and try to chase like say eight plus percent um in the markets now here's the deal that is taking on a lot of risk so not only are we giving up control with the classic uh methodology we're taking on a lot of risk which risk equals loss greater chance of loss so the more risk the higher the rate of return we're chasing the higher the risk is the higher the chance of loss, right? So that is key to understand. And so it doesn't make any sense because what's happening is we're focused, everybody's been trained, I think very intentionally, quite frankly, to focus on taking a lot of risk with a small percentage of our income because people can swallow that. They can, they can stomach that because the way most people think, that's an acceptable tolerance. But the bottom line is when we look at the other 90%, because if you're not saving it and you're not delaying gratification in a retirement account, that means this goes into lifestyle. What, what infinite banking allows you to do by doing it this way, because you never give up control of your money. And if you design a policy that literally is net net positive cash flow starting year two with these numbers right here, if you look at it from that perspective, what, what it enables you to do is it enables you to look at the rest of the 90% of your life focused on efficiency. Now here's the deal. If I, if I were to ask you in your life, how much inefficiency do you have? Could you find 1% of financial inefficiency? Let's take, let's take $100,000 per year of household income. That's it. 1% of financial inefficiency on, on, on $90,000 because 90% of 100,000 is 90,000 bucks. Fair enough. We're saving the 10. Let's just focus. Let's say you don't even stop saving that 10. You just keep doing that. You keep taking your risk. You keep doing your thing. I promise you that's not gonna get you where you wanna go. It's just not going to do it. So if you wanna get where you wanna go, you gotta do something different. You gotta become something more. And that's what an infinite banking policy is gonna allow you to do is focusing on making this $90,000 more efficient. If you could find 1%, I think that's $990 extra per year. That's the equivalent $990 on a $10,000, remember, so if you're already saving 10,000, right? If I add $990 there, no risk, that's 10,990. That's the equivalent of a 9.9% .9 return, 990 bucks is 9.9% .9 of 10,000, do the math. Just operating 1% more efficiently is gonna help you get 9.9% equivalent return on the 10,000 that you're already saving just by operating more efficiently. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know where, what, what's going on in your life, but the bottom line is most people that I speak with have at least five to 10% inefficiencies. So think about it. If, if you had 10% inefficiency, right? That's $9,900 at 10%, right? That's the equivalent of almost 100% rate of return, right? That's $9,900 on 10,000, obviously, right? Is is basically 100% rate of return, rounding error once again. And so it's a 99% rate of return, I guess, if we wanna be precise. And so when we look at it like that and we realize, man, if, if my real issue isn't my investments, my real issue isn't the risk I'm taking up here because I'm not saying don't take risk, I'm saying make sure you're operating more efficiently. And when you do, you're enable yourself to set yourself up with a financial structure. If you look at the financial pyramid, what people need to do, it starts with a base of cash flow. That has to be the mindset. That is the, the, the bedrock that we try to build it on is the foundation of understanding cash flow. And then we need to build safety, right? And that's what the banking policy is gonna do. The, the more safe, liquid, accessible capital we build up here, the more safety that we have, the more opportunity that's gonna come because opportunity comes to the prepared, right? And then when we have it and we're ready, now we can go and get those medium risk investments like uh, real estate, cash flow, real estate. I would always say invest for cash flow, whatever it is, whether it's stocks, make sure they're dividend paying stocks that are gonna kick, kick out passive cash flow, cash flow, real estate, ca passive businesses, anything like that. And then you take the money 
and you trickle it down into the cash flow and then you let the cash flow repay your system and as you get more these become bigger and bigger and then eventually uh, when you get to enough now you can start taking higher risk investments and this is a compounding effect now the bottom line is the reason i show this is it, people freak out about this because they look at a typical infinite banking and they go oh my gosh the rate of return in this policy is just not good enough because you know 10 years out why would i put money inside of a policy you know that maybe gets me two and a half percent over a 10-year period i'll tell you a this is going to get better if interest rates keep going up because it's going to trail um, the fixed markets this is in the lowest all-time interest rate of, of, of all time these are the lowest dividend scales that we've ever seen and that's what they're paying out at and this company's never missed a dividend for 120 years so like that is what it is now when when i look at this when somebody goes oh why would i do that as well it's because of control it's because of all the things that i've been talking about when you think long term this makes all the sense in the world by doing this yeah you're missing out op on opportunity in a way um, because you're, you're maybe you're not able to get that uh, that 15 percent return in that year with the stock market and you're putting your money here but you're not really like that's the that's the broke person's way of thinking about these things because you're looking at this and you're going oh if i have this money if you think like somebody who's sophisticated or a bit more sophisticated you go i have access to that capital i could leverage it i could go and put money into if i feel like i'm ready more medium risk real estate cash flow investments businesses whatever it is create that cash flow pay back that loan and and then realize what this is going to do for me long term even if i'm not making positive arbitrage immediately when i think long term this always makes sense and it solves it's getting every dollar in our life to perform more than one function and so when we look at coming back to the main topic of this video what is the internal rate of return of a of infinite banking in general because remember infinite banking this is where people get it wrong infinite banking is not a product it's a philosophy it's a concept it's you that's why i say it's the only financial strategy in the world that's going to force you to become who you need to be to get to where you want to go and and i'm telling you right now one of the best things that i ever did was took money from this and the medium risk some might say it's high risk is i invested in myself right myself and what is this events networking connecting going to masterminds doing stuff like that i can tell you i've taken I've, I've made better returns in going to different events and building my personal network and investing in myself my skills my knowledge my time buying that time buying events doing stuff like that those have produced more results for me now here's the deal this is the, this is the other thing to say this is incalculatable right like you cannot calculate how good of a return you're going to get inside of um yeah uh, inside of a properly designed whole life policy it's all based on control right and opportunity but the bottom line the biggest variable in this is you what rate of return you're going to get in this is going to be based on who are you are you willing to grow are you willing to become who you want to be to get to where you want to be that's it that's my only question to you and if you could figure that out well and if you're willing to take that journey and if you're willing to go slow to go fast and if you're willing to delay gratification and you're really willing let's go over here if you're really willing to delay gratification and yeah you have access you have control of this money you have opportunity here right um but if you're willing to delay on this and and build the foundation of, of your financial life which is what i'm talking about right here if you're willing to build that foundation my promise to you is that it's going to be worth it you know like if you want to operate like a real investor you got to stop behaving like a speculator speculators take and they take too much risk too soon before they're ready people like warren buffett the wealthiest people in the world make more money when there's blood in the streets when there's these market corrections like back at the pandemic 2008 the dot-com bubble 1994 1997 1981 all these times in the in the recent history the reason there's a growing gap between the wealthy and the middle class is because of the fact that the middle class is not doing this this is what the most successful people in the world but it's only about five percent of the people so if you want to be successful listen i'm not saying you have to do it this is this is this other thing i say is you have a decision to make a couple decisions to make and you got to do them in stages the first decision is what do you think you need to do from a financial structure perspective and that's what the pyramid here is all about 
Do you believe, does this make sense that you should invest for cash flow so you can actually get behind believing you can do it? Do you believe that you need to build your foundation of safety so then you can go out and take risks that way? If the market corrects, you know, you, you're not like having all your life on, on the risk of high risky assets, right? Like investing in the market, right? So if you believe that, that's the first, first thing that you need to ask yourself is, do you believe that you need to save before you invest? And make no mistake about it, it's gonna be probably one of the hardest things you ever do is delaying gratification and saving up before you go and take the risk and speculating in certain risks when you're ready. But if you do it right, if you build your foundation, if you structure your life properly, it'll open up more opportunity than you ever saw. Now, the second thing is if you believe that you should do that, the second component that you need to consider is, okay, if I'm gonna save that money, where's the best place to save my money? Where's the best place to keep my safe, liquid, accessible capital that I want to leverage in my life? And when you look at a properly designed whole life insurance policy, it becomes a no brainer because now you have an account that's gonna destroy the actual returns in your bank account. You're gonna have the bank account liquidity with bond-like returns, plus you're gonna have that access to life insurance, which is gonna operate and increase your efficiency there. You can leverage this as your own banking alternative, which is fantastic. You know, And this is why I say it needs to be whole life insurance. You cannot use index universal life because these, um, when, you, when you sign a whole life contract, the here's the deal, with whole life, control and all the contractual rights are with the policyholder. With IUL, the contractual rights are with the insurance carrier, the insurance company, right? So the reason that we need to do this is we always want to be playing where the rules are tipped in our favor. With an IUL, that's not the case. With a whole life policy, that is the case. And that's something that I think not enough people take seriously enough, especially in the world that we're coming into right now. This is why I did the IUL challenge over the past decade. IULs in the greatest bull market have never performed the way that they were sold. And the reason, at least on the majority of 99 plus percent of the policies that were sold, didn't perform. And the reason has nothing to do with the fact that they weren't structured properly. It has everything to do is the fact that the control is in the insurance carrier and they've had the ability to reduce cap rates reduce participation rates and reduce overall performance of the policy by internal moving mechanisms like fees and cost of insurance and all the other variables that give you your crediting, crediting strategy, crediting rating out of the IUL. And that's why they haven't performed even in the greatest bull run. IUL performance has nothing to do with the indexes at the end of the day. It all has to do, I've got a lot of videos on that and we're not gonna get into that now, but that's why when I talk about this, when I talk about infinite banking, it has to be done with whole life because philosophically it's not a product, it's a philosophy. And the only way to implement that philosophy is by having control. And as the policyholder with the whole life, you are in control, IULs, the insurance company is and not you. And so those are things to consider. So if you have any questions, comment in the comment section below. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell, that way you're notified every time I launch a new video. Hope you found value in this. If you have any questions, comment. I'm, I'm serious. Like. If you found value in this, do me a favor, like give me a thumbs up in the comment section, give it a like, give it a share, do something. Uh, I really appreciate that because it lets me know that you're finding this valuable, especially if you're seeing this at the end and you give it a thumbs up, I'll know you were here watching at this point in time. I'm really curious to see how many people are hearing me talk right now. Give me a thumbs up because uh, it's really important. Like I, I feel like this is one of the most important videos I've done as far as like people really understanding the internal workings philosophically of internal rate of return and how you need to like think about it in a different way when it comes to infinite banking and just whole life insurance in general when it's designed properly. So that's it. Have a blessed inspirational day. We'll talk soon.